today what we're going to be covering is lesson three sampling that lesson three activity though um, it does start out in the beginning as i'm sure you saw in the worksheet if you took a look at it the first couple things we're going to work on are a review of uh, lesson two the vocabulary of statistics there was a lot of nuance in that vocabulary of statistics i want to remind you um, about that q a board on canvas um, to ask questions there i think you should be working together on this material math and statistics are not things that are meant to be worked on on their own that conversation between you and somebody else and even if that conversation happens with you and yourself, verbalizing things out loud is huge for learning because your brain hears what you're saying and it processes it differently from when you're just sitting there thinking about it. So finding people to talk about it with, even, um, even like a group text or a Discord or something like that. I can't set up a Discord because there's uh, kind of privacy issues involved with that, but you can certainly set up a Discord. But I also want to remind you here on the mon modules page, I've got the student cafe, which is the help, the place to get help for the Q&A. You can post your questions here. You all have Zoom accounts now. Uh, a lot of my students will have Zoom um, study groups and you can invite me to the Zoom study group. You have my, my cell number, text me. You know, if it's nine o'clock at night and you folks are stuck at something, shoot me a text. I'm often and up and I can join your Zoom room. I'm here for you. I know these are crazy, unprecedented times and I'm, I'm trying to be as flexible and available to you as possible. Let's get started on the lesson. So this is the lesson three sampling worksheet. And you see example one is just a review of lesson two. Okay, so I'd like you to take a moment and read through this. And while you're reading, underline the important parts. And if you want to follow along, I'll show you what I, I'm going to use a highlighter. An insurance company would like to determine the proportion of, there we go, all medical doctors who have been involved in one or more pros, malpractice lawsuit. That seems important. The company selects 500 doctors at random from a professional di directory and determines the number in the sample who have been involved in a malpractice lawsuit. That seems important too. Okay, so you see how I pulled out all of the important, what I think is the important information. Now the question is, what do you think the population is? Remember the population is the entirety of the group that you're interested in. Okay, and if you look at this, it's that's here, all medical doctors. The sample, that's where you, that remember the sample should always give you a number and who it was. Okay, so the sample is going to be that smaller group we use to get information. Okay, so in this case, we have 500 doctors who were chosen from a medical directory. Okay, does anyone have any questions or is anyone unclear? on how I determine those. All right, so let's talk about the variable. The variable is where I think from what I was looking at the um, homework, I think that's where a lot of people um, got messed up was what the variable was. And it this is, this is difficult folks, okay? So definitely don't beat yourself up. It's a lot of nuance. It's a lot of complexity kind of all at once. The variable, is the specific thing we want to know about the population. What is it that we want to know about those medical doctors? Isn't that here they're involved in one or more malpractice lawsuits? One or more just means you're involved, period, right? I mean, that, that one or more is like any malpractice lawsuits. Going on to the data, the data is the specific information we gather from our sample, okay? In this case, it's not directly said what the data are, but it is in there, okay? So we, what did we do with that professional directory? Well, we opened it up, you know, those professional directories are basically, you know, they're like a yearbook, if you will, kind of a cross between a yearbook and a white pages. <laughs> All right, so, they grab this, 
they randomly selected 500 doctors, right? So they could have just been flipping pages and put in their finger on a name. And then what are they going to do? They're going to look them up and see, are they, were they involved in a malpractice lawsuit? And so the, this data that they're gathering is really a yes, no on the malpractice. And so for all 500 of those doctors, they're going to have a yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Okay, so the statistic then, and data and statistic are related, but again, we have more nuance happening with these two. Because the statistic, you're actually doing some analysis on the data. Okay, the data is the raw, the yes or no, for each of those 500 doctors. You're going to have 500 Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Okay, but that doesn't help us understand how many doctors in general are involved in malpractice Last, lawsuits. We have to do something with that data. Okay, so the statistic is the result of analyzing the data. Okay, so the result of analyzing the raw data. Are we told, like, you'd look for keywords like the average or something like that. All right, we're not actually told specifically what it is, but it would be the num the um, proportion or the percentage. Proportion is just a different word for percentage of doctors who are involved in a suit. Okay, does that make sense? So if we if we surveyed all 500 or we did those 500, we completed them, and then we looked at the yeses and nos, let's say 60% 60, 60 of them were involved in a, in a lawsuit. That would be the statistic. And remember, the key thing is that the key terms is the statistic is always goes with, with the sample. That same thing of, of the, all the medical doctors – if we had a statistic about all medical doctors, that would be a parameter. I shouldn't use the word statistic, sorry. Okay, the proportion, and that's just another word for percent, of all, so the percentage of all the doctors involved in a malpractice suit would be a parameter. So it's quite possible that, let's say, you know, 20% of all doctors, and I'm totally making this up, okay, versus our sample might have 50%. All right, so this then parameter I put up there. So let's go to numbers two and three. We're going to kind of do two and three together. I'm giving you some data and some information, and I'm asking you to determine if the data are quantitative or qualitative. And I will remind you that quantitative data is generally – if we're looking at numbers, now this is generally speaking, and qualitative data tends to be categories, tends to be, not 100% of the time. When you're reading through these two, circle the information that you think is most important or underline it or highlight it, something. When you're working through any problem, remember you're not just thinking about do I understand it now you should be thinking about whether or not you're going to understand it in four weeks from now so in a lot of ways when you're doing this work think about your future self and talk to your future self right so that's why I put this these types of things here this is my way to help me remember what do you think Number two is asking, says the data is the number of books carrying and their students carry in their backpacks. You sample five students, two students carry three books, one student carries four books, one another carries two books, another carries one book. Is that type of data quantitative or qualitative? Okay, lots of people say A. All right, and the A's have it. Yes, it is quantitative. Excellent. The colors of the backpack students carry. Is it red, one was black, one green, one gray? Is that quantitative or qualitative? So ask yourself, is it a number that they're looking at or is it a category? One student had red backpack, two had black backpacks, one had a green. Those are categories. Colors are categories. So this one is actually qualitative. Quantitative, qualitative. Okay, because these are categories, gray, red, black. Now let's look at doing it more at a more refined level. Okay, so I have four examples here, and you're asked, are they nominal 
ordinal, interval, or ratio. And I will remind you, nominal and ordinal are qualitative, and interval and ratio are quantitative. And for the quantitative, the ratio has a meaningful zero, where zero means nothing is happening and that there is nothing exists. And ordinal is categories with an order. So for me, I just remember those two things. Remembering four definitions is a little too much for my little brain. Okay, so I try to focus on just two of them, and then I know if I can figure out if it's ratio. If it's not ratio, then it's got to be interval. If I can figure out if it's ordinal, then if it's not ordinal, it's nominal. Okay, that's how my brain works. You do whatever works best for you. Heartbeat, nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. So first decide, is it a category or is it a number? And then if it's a number, does it have a meaningful zero? It is majority rules. It is a ratio. The heartbeat is a ratio because a zero, well, first of all, it's a number, but I see everyone got the, at least that it's quantitative. Zero heartbeat actually means you're dead or you're flatlined. So that is a meaningful zero. What about temperature? Is temperature, now temperature has a zero. Here's some examples. Temperature has a zero, but is that a meaningful zero? Or is it a category? Temperature has a zero degrees, but it's not meaningful. That zero degrees is, is just demarcating something occurring. Okay, and zero degrees Celsius means that uh, water freezes. But you can go negative. Okay, so this is an interval because the zero is not meaningful for temperature. It's just demarking something happening. Okay, let's do pain level. All right, so you folks say ordinal for the pain level. Yeah, it's a, those are categories. We've got three categories, but there's an order to them. Order, ordinal. So yeah, good job. You're absolutely correct. Okay, what about tobacco use? Good job, nominal. Yes, awesome. Because that those are categories, but there's no order to them. By the way, vaping, you shouldn't vape, folks. You know, vape, um, it's not regulated. There's people problems with people getting lung disease from vaping. It's very dangerous. Uh, let's move on to the heart of the matter. And let's talk about sampling. Really any survey, any drug trial, like there's so many things in the world that deal with sampling, right? And even music, as we learned in last class. The key in statistics is we want that sample, ideally, for it to be done well, the sample must contain the characteristics of the population in order for us to call it a representative sample. And we kind of talked about this a little bit last week, I think. Representative samples should, what that means is that it contains all the characteristics of the population or as close to those characteristics as possible, including the proportion, right? So for an example, if we talk about incarceration rates, last I checked a couple of years ago, I, I haven't had a chance to check recently, but as, as recently as a couple of years ago, anyway, the number of people incarcerated in this country, the proportion, the highest proportion of people are white. That might go counter to what you're, how you think about it because of based on the news and these um, defunding the police and the um, calls for prison reform. The, where those prison reform, where that idea comes from is if you look at a different aspect of incarceration other than just the straight numbers of who's there most, African Americans and Latinos are overrepresented in the prison population. And what that means is there's way more Latinos and African Americans in prison than in the actual population. Don't quote me on these numbers, folks, okay? I'm, this is just, I'm, this is my vague recollection of what it is, but it is, for example, no, let's just not talk, I'm not even trying to, um, this is just for an example. If our population was, um, and again, these numbers are totally made up, okay? 15% African American and 20% Latinx, but our incarcerated rate, forgive me if that's not spelled correctly, incarcerated rate are something like 25% African American and 40% Latinx. Those numbers don't make any sense at all. Do not quote me on this. <laughs> all right, so this is this is overrepresentation. 
here. The people incarcerated are not a representative sample of the prison. For example, in, in last in last week, what I talked about is polling, right? The polling, um, if you're going to do some kind of like let's say political poll, and you're only polling people in the San Francisco Bay Area, is that going to be representative for the entire U.S.? No way, not at all. It's not a representative population. All right, so how we sample is critically important. And who we sample is critically important. I thought this was funny. Those of you who are old enough might remember those Trident gum, but they have these commercials and it said three out of four dentists recommend Trident gum. How many dentists do you think they surveyed? Three out of four dentists, it was literally only four dentists. <laughs> So they they stopped running these commercials, uh, but they ran for a long time, very long time, right? So you can't always trust the data that's put in front of you. Okay, so we're going to do a sampling activity now. So this is kind of a silly example, but it's fun. All right, so we have here the Gettysburg Address. We can consider this population, we're going to consider the, the whole Gettysburg Address, which is here, we're going to consider this a population. And what I want each of you to do is to select a sample of 10 representative words here, and you can choose them any way you want to. There are 268 words. Select 10 of them. And make sure to circle them or highlight them or something because we're going to um, count the number of letters next. Okay, what we're going to do down below is once you pick those 10 words, and you can pick them however you want to, it's your choice. Just pick 10 of the words, circle them or highlight them. And then what we're going to do is record the length of those words. And what I find is a little bit easier, I actually put the words down here. Let's count how many letters are in each of the words you chose and put them down here. When you finish that, you can then think about the answer to question five, and we're going to determine the average mean number of letters in the sample. To find the mean, or what most of us just call the average, is we're going to add up all the letters and divide by 10. And we're choosing 10 because that's how many words we have. Okay, so those are my words, and I want to make sure um, there's something important happening with your calculator. Hopefully you all have a graphing calculator now. Okay, and when you put these in your calculator, we need to put parentheses around the top numbers if we want to put this all in at once. Okay, I personally am fond of um, adding up all the top numbers first. On your calculator, put parentheses, and I'll show you how to, ver I have, I've got an online graphing calculator. So I'm going to use the parentheses, which are right above the eight. And then I'm going to put in all the, the word numbers, or how many letters, I mean. And I always like to stop and count to make sure I have 10 there. And so now you see what I'm going to do is I'm going to close the parentheses, which is above the 9. And then I can do the divided by 10. If you wanted to do this separately, you could delete, which is up here. And you could just press Enter. And so my total is 48. And then you could do the divided by 10. And you see how I just did, I just pressed divided by 10, and it automatically knew that I meant divide that 48 by 10. Okay, so I've got 48. So of the words I chose, I got an average of 4.8. So how did you choose which words to pick of those 10? I'm just curious, what method did you use? Now tell me what was your average word count. Round, round to the nearest 0. 0.5, okay? Is it, all right, so lots of big words. That's interesting, okay? Where's the middle of I would say most of us, if we're looking at our class average, that's somewhere around, I would say, you know, remember that looking for the middle, you're thinking about this all being stacks of cans on a plank, and where would you have to hold that plank? 
if you could only use one hand, where, could, where would you hold it so that all the cans would stay put? So the, that's called the fulcrum. So where would the fulcrum be? I'd say about 5.5. So our class average is about 5.5, 6, maybe leaning towards 6. Okay. How does your average compare to the actual Gettysburg address? I'm just curious, did you get more than, less than, or exactly 4.3? Most people got more than 4.3, and that kind of makes sense based on what method you chose. We saw a lot of people that said they chose the biggest words or the words they didn't know, which tends to be bigger words. And that's the answer to question eight. You notice I have the question number up there. Me just saying choose a word at random actually has bias built into it. Why do you think that would be? What everyone's saying, you're absolutely correct. This is hitting the nail on the head. This is why that's biased. Also think about how people were choosing the words. So that leads towards kind of a skewing towards the heavier side oftentimes. But if we look to the answer to the last question, most of the people, their word count was more than 4.3. Yes? Do I recall that correctly? Okay, I don't want to move away from this because I'm still reading what people are saying. Um, but I believe most people had more than 4.3, which again, it's biased. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a truly random sample next. We're going to and we're going to see how that different, how that's different. And here we see for the most part in number 10, do we think words chosen chose at random tends to overestimate or underestimate? It overestimated. Okay, this is called the direction of the bias. You don't need to know that term, but it's just an interesting little tidbit. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to do this again, but we're going to use what's called a simple random sample. And a simple random sample, you need to know this terminology, gives every observational unit in the population the same chance of being selected. So this flipping a coin, rolling a dice, those kinds of things are simple random samples. So we're going to do this again, except we're going to have the computer choose the sample for us and see what I've done here is every single word of the Gettysburg Address is assigned a number. And this is a really common method of taking a, finding a simple random sample. You could do this with assigning people numbers, assigning objects numbers, like I've done here, words, every word has a number. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to use a, our graphing calculator or use random.org. Okay, and we're going to pick 10 random numbers. So uh, I'll show you how to use the graphing calculator and the random.org. Okay, so we can use the random.org. And what you're going to do is the random number generator. Now you're going to pick a number from 1 to 268 because that's where our max is. And we're going to click generate. 255. So write down 255 on your paper and then press it again. This Don't copy my answers. Do your own, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just showing you how it works. Those of you with a graphing calculator, the instructions are on here, but we can have the graphing calculator spit out 10 random numbers. And the nice thing about the graphing calculator is it does it all in one, one go. Okay, so we're going to press the math button, which is over here on the left-hand side, and then over arrow over to probability, PRB, that's probability, and then random int means random integer. Integers are counting numbers. So we're going to go down to five. And then we're going to press enter. And the minimum is one. And the maximum, oh, whoops, and press arrow down. Maximum is 268, arrow down. And n is how many we want. So we want 10. My calculator, here's that my random 10 numbers. So your screen is too small. It won't give you all of these in one go. What you need to do is do the arrow, do the right arrow over, and it will show you everything in that list. Okay, but I'll do that one more time. So start out with a second mode and that quits everything, or you can press clear. Why does it have the minimum or maximum? Thank you for, for mentioning that. If you don't have the menu that I got, what we're going to do is, again, math, 
the order that we put stuff in is the same, or the beginning stuff's the same. Arrow over to probability, arrow down to number five, and press enter. See, that says random integer. Rand int, and I apologize, they intentionally made this really low resolution, which is stupid. But okay, now what we're going to do is tell it the minimum number, and that's one. And you're going to have to put a comma in there manually. So the comma is right above the seven. And then the maximum number, which is 268. And then another comma. And then tell it how many numbers you want. So we're going to press 10. And then press enter. And there's your list. And now you see, you see how I only have four numbers here, but there's this little arrow to the right. If I press the right arrow, it scrolls through this list. So I can get all 10 of them. When you see this little parentheses, curly parentheses bracket, that's how you know you're at the end of the list. So if you press anything else before you press that right arrow, it goes away. So what you want to do, um, and this is for everybody, this is a hot trick that you really want to remember. It's going to save us so much time. Press second, enter, and it brings back what we just entered in, random int 1, 2, 6, 8, comma 10, and press enter again. Now don't press anything else and scroll over to the right. And see, it gives you a new list of 10 numbers. Now, with each number, you have a number associated that tells you the word. Now, figure out the word length that goes with that number. And I personally found it easier to go through and highlight the numbers or circle them or something to help just keep track. And then we're going to find that. Oh, whoops, we're going to find that average as well. OK, so I got an average of 6.3, which was very different from the 4.3 I got before. Much higher. Could you remind me again on the calculator how to do um, the average? I forgot. Thank you for asking. So I'm going to clear the, all of this screen just using the clear button. And I'm going to use the parentheses above the 8 and then put on all my word counts 4 plus 6. So the key is either you need to find the sum first and then do the division or to put it in all at once, you've got to use this set of parentheses. And that has to do with the order of operations. You might remember PEMDAS. Okay, so you see I have the sum, and that sum is all in parentheses, and then I can divide by 10. So when you're finished, what was your average word count? I have no assumptions that any of you know how to use this graphing calculator. So trust me, we will walk through it every single time we need to use it. On the worksheet web, the worksheet page for each lesson in, includes a video for whatever we're doing on the graphing calculator for that lesson. Okay, and you, as you saw, I have to remind myself every single semester. How did I do that again? You see how this differs so much from that last one? See, we don't have any of these high counts. We don't have any. And there's nothing up at this above six. And most people got five, which five is a lot closer to the actual average. The actual average was 4.3. And our average here is about 4.7. We're much, much closer now. So using actual genuine randomness outside of our own brain is more reflective of the population, okay? Because we have these unconscious biases that are being built in to um, our choices. In fact, um, anyone here a fan of the show Numbers? Anyone seen the show Numbers? Even if you don't like that show, which personally I'm not a fan, but I will say that very first episode on how they um, how they caught a serial killer, that is true. It was a mathematician that found the serial killer because they figured out that if you're going to kill somebody, you're going to go far away enough from your home that people aren't going to recognize you, but not so far away from your home that you're not familiar with the area. So they were able to put basically like a donut ring around, uh, around certain areas based on where the killing was and the, the first killing. 
and they were able to canvas neighborhoods and they were able to narrow it down to a three blocks that the killer must have been on these three blocks using mathematical analyses and the fact that nothing we do is actually random. Okay, so watch that first episode of Numbers. It's very interesting. That I mean, that's the key takeaway from this Getty Bergs lesson is what you chose was so much bigger of a number than what the random number generator chose. And every time you do it, you might wind up with different numbers. Um, and sometimes you'll just randomly get big numbers and sometimes you'll randomly get small numbers. But the actual true random of Ness, using an actually true, truly random method is more representative, but still can have those extremes, but it's always more representative. So let's talk about the different types of sampling. The one with using that random number generator or the calculator, that's called simple random sampling because it's like simple and random just having a computer spit out numbers. I mean, that's why it's called that. And it's often abbreviated SRS. We're going to watch a video because I think this video does a much better job at explaining. And even if we were meeting in person, I would actually be showing this um, video in class. Is This is from the Lesson 3 Worksheet Assignment. We're going to watch this sampling techniques video. Sampling techniques. In this video presentation, I am going to discuss sampling techniques. First, we have a simple random sample. And with a simple random sample, subjects are simply randomly selected from the population. You can think of it as placing names in a hat and then randomly selecting subjects. So the names of individuals or subjects from the population are placed in a hat and then to select your sample you simply randomly select subjects from your hat and they'll be a part of the sample. Next we have a stratified sample and with a stratified sample the population is divided into strata or groups and the individuals within each group are similar so for example, if you wanted to analyze men versus women, you would divide the entire population into two groups, men and women, and then you randomly select subjects from each group. The third type of sampling technique is referred to as a systematic sample. With a systematic sample, every kth subject is selected to be part of the sample. K can represent any number, so for this example, we're interested in every third subject. So we count every third subject in the population, and those individuals would be a part of the sample. Next, we have the cluster sample. And with the cluster sample, the population is divided into clusters. And these clusters are basically ill-defined groups. You can think of clusters as counties in a state. Counties are individual groups within the state, and within each group, all the individuals are different. And when using a cluster sample, subjects are randomly selected based on clusters. And so you would gather entire clusters to be a part of the sample. So once again, you have your entire population that that's divided into these clusters and then you randomly select entire clusters to be a part of the sample. All right, so like I said, that video is um, on our Canvas site. But I also want to show you one uh, distinction, a, a way to visualize a little bit better the stratified sampling versus the cluster sampling because that gets really confusing for a lot of students. But so here you can think the stratified sampling and the cluster sampling both are similar in that they both break down the population into groups. So here we have the population broken down into groups two different ways, six groups in each of them. But you see the stratified sampling, all the black dots are together, all the blue dots are together, purple dots, they're grouped by color. And then we take some from each color. So, and that has to be a representative sample of the population proportionally. Okay, so if 20% of the population 
of dots is black, then we're going to bring by we're going to pick 20% of the population within our sample. Versus cluster sampling, this was the example that she was just saying with the counties. If we have six different counties, we pick two randomly and we sample everybody in those two counties. So clusters, you're picking the whole cluster, you're dividing them into groups and picking the whole cluster. And stratified, we're dividing them into groups, but we're picking just a few in each group to make sure that every group is represented in our sample. Hopefully that helps you understand the difference between those two. On the worksheet, I've written them down as well. On the top of page five, I have an explanation and that every nth piece of the systematic method is, that's what I use to do the, my Gettysburg address. I took every like 27th word and I saw a couple of you did something similar. You took every 10th word. That's a systematic method. You're starting at one point and then you're picking every 10th or every 20th. Now the thing is that systematic doesn't have to begin at the beginning. You can randomly pick a place to start and then do every 27th or every 10th. I have more examples for you in, in just the last few minutes of class. Let's talk about example four, okay? A study is done to determine the average tuition at the San Jose State undergraduates that students pay every semester. And so I have a bunch of examples of how that study is done. Tell me what type of sampling method you think they're using in each of these examples. Okay, so number 16, a sample of 100 undergraduates is taken by organizing the students' names by classification and then selecting 25 students from each. What method do you think that is? You could do process of elimination on these. Was that, is that a simple random? No, it's based on classification which should tell you that it's either a stratified or a cluster sample. Good job. That is stratified because there's specific groups, and then we're taking um, 25 students from each group, and that's the key from each group versus the entire group. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. And again, the 20B, I forgot I changed the numbering for the worksheets you have. They use a random number generator to pick the first one, then picking every 50th student after that. You see two different methods in here, but there is a key phrase that gives you a hint. We have a random number generator telling us where to start. Just because you see they use the sandal san random number generator doesn't mean it's a simple random. It depends on what they do with that generator. We're just using that to figure out where to start. The key term here is every 50th student. That is systematic. Anytime you're counting off and then picking that one, you're following a systematic pattern, okay? And so that's why this one is actually D, it's systematic. Let's go on to the next one. And this is actually like number 23. Okay, so a completely random method where everyone has the same probability of being chosen. That could be names in a hat, flipping a coin, you have a roster of people, and you go down the roster, and with each person you flip a coin, heads is yes, you're including them, tails is no, you're not including them. There's a whole bunch of ways you could do that. Good job, folks. That's simple random. Excellent. Let's go on to the next one. Put them into four groups and we use a random number generator to pick a group and then every person in that group is selected. You're absolutely correct. That's a cluster sample. And the key in this one is that every person in that group is selected. We're taking clusters to participate. I'll let you finish. Uh, example five is similar to this, is just picking the type of sample. The bias one, we'll pick that up next class. Next class, we'll finish up the bias, talk about that a little bit. Have a great afternoon, everybody. And remember, I'll be sticking around for the next half an hour if you have any questions, okay?